Hello everyone, welcome back to chapter 7. So we are now going to be starting in the second module of chapter 7, which is 7.2, which if we look at it, it's all about language, and which will probably make a lot of you happy for this one. In the review guide, there are only three things that you will need to know from this. So I'll make sure to touch upon them, but of course I'm going to be talking about all of module 7.2. Let's get into it. So we just talked about language, or sorry, we just talked about thinking, um, and how thinking works, all the different types of thinking, all the things that help us with problem solving, the whole idea of creativity, and so now we're going to be talking about language, and just what is language, how does it work, how does it form, is it something that only humans can do, um, and this should be a shorter video, because again, there's three things that you'll need to know, this is a shorter module. Um, same with 7.3. So let's get right into it. And... All right. So before anything, we need to know what we mean by language. And when we talk about language in this class, it is a system of communication consisting of symbols, words, or hand signs arranged accordingly to a set of rules called grammar to express meaning. I like that this definition also talks about words and hand signs because, of course, not everyone can hear. A lot of time when people hear language, they think, oh, you know, that's, you know, talking to one another. And that's not necessarily true. While a lot of language consists of it being verbally um, communicated, there are different forms of language out there, uh, such as American Sign Language. But if it's essentially giving some sort of meaning, and communication through some sort of set of rules that is a form of language as far as psychology is concerned. And speaking of certain rules, um, there's a certain structure to language and the one that you will need to be focused on, which I will be going into more detail on, is a whole idea of morphemes, which you can see up there, but we're going to very quickly talk about all of these different structures of language. First one is a phoneme. Phoneme is simply the smallest unit of sound in a spoken language. Um, so just any language out there um, has different sounds that make it up. In our English language, we have 44. Um, so there's like a, ah, b, ch, f, s. All of the, just the different sounds that make up our language. They don't necessarily have meaning, but they're the sounds. There are other languages out there that have like clicking noises that are used in their language. Um, if you've ever learned a foreign language, you will find that there are certain sounds that are just harder to produce. Um, I know that when I was learning French, I learned that French people learning English tend to struggle with H because there's no letter, there's no sound, there's no word in their language that has that kind of sound to it. So that's what we mean by phonemes. It's just simply the different sounds. Morphemes, on the other hand, are the smallest unit of meaning in a language. So it's not just a random sound, it's if you hear this unit, it has a purpose, it has a meaning. And we'll go into more detail um, and some examples of that on the next slide. We also have pragmatics. That's the patterns of innotations um, and social roles associated, um, or sorry, intonations, um, and social roles associated with language. So, you know, when you're asking a question and the way that you talk to people, um, just the way that you come across um, as the pragmatics. Then we also have syntax. Um, this along with semantics, um, I'm also going to talk about in a little bit more detail. Syntax are the specific rules for arranging and combining words. So, you know, what goes first, the noun, the verb, the adjective, all of that, um, which you've been learning in English classes for uh, like 12 years straight. And then we have semantics, which you've seen before when we talked about semantic memory. And I said that the thing to remember about semantics, semantics is that it means meaning. So it's the meaning of a word. Um, and I mean, you'll see what I mean when we talk about uh, the examples on the next few slides. But depending on the sentence that's being used, sometimes the meaning of the word 
can change. So it's just some examples of morphemes, because again, this is something you will need to know for the exam, um, which again, it's the smallest unit with a meaning to it. Um, so one example that I put in here is you have desire. We all know what desire means. Um, you know, it's like wanting something. That's one morpheme. You can't break down the word desire into anything smaller. Then you have, where'd my mouse go? There we go. Um, desirable. So we still have desire, you know, to want something, but now we've attached able to the end. So now it is someone that is able to be desired, or something that is able to be desired. It's desirable. Now there's two different meanings that make up that word. Then you have desirability. Um, and then you slap un to the beginning of it, and you have undesirability. This is an example of the, kind of the different types of morphemes that can be out there, where you have a prefix, a root, and a suffix. The most common prefix being un. You can have the word happy. Happy means, you know, that you're in a good mood, stuff like that. Attach un to the beginning, and we immediately know that that now means that someone is not happy. So simply by adding that morphine, it changes the meaning of the word. So that's what we mean by morphemes. Like, un is not a complete word on its own, but it still has meaning. It means not. Um, and then I just put an example of a different language out there, and it kind of shows how add you, how or as you add more and more morphemes, it changes uh, the meaning derived from it. And then we have semantics versus syntax. So again, semantics is the meaning. So we have a sen sentence here. God, I always lose my mouse. I am running. If you look at this image when you say it, it's like, oh, you know, it's someone running a marathon. But if you see this image, it's like, oh, you know, it's someone who's running to be president or running to be governor. It's still the same word, but in each sentence, it means something different. The semantics have changed. And then we have syntax, which is just the way that a sentence is worded, um, or the order in which the words are arranged um, affect how we interpret that sentence. So you have the man walks the dog. So you have the man that's walking the dog. You know, it's the man is the noun. But then you have the dog walks the man. So now it's the dog that's walking the man. So it goes in, you know, we interpret that in a different way because the order of the words is different. Um, so that's what we mean by syntax. And you'll see that in different languages, the syntax, syntax is different. For example, I've been learning Spanish, and if I was to say, you know, I have a cat, and I have a cat who's black, um, I also have a cat who's white. So I would say, uh, oh boy, here we go, el gato blanco. Um, would be my white cat. If I said it in English, I would say, you know, my white cat, or the white cat, to keep it the same. When you're saying it in Spanish, you say la, no, el gato blanco, the cat white. So the syntax is different, but in Spanish, that's just the order of the words. Um, so syntax can be different in different languages. Um, I talked about American Sign Language very quickly at the beginning. Syntax in American Sign Language is also different than it is American English. Um, and then there's just kind of this example that sometimes when you can't, and I know it kind of runs off a little bit, um, but sometimes, there we go, even when you have um, the same words in the same order, it can be interpreted differently. So you have Sherlock saw the man using binoculars, or Sherlock saw the man using binoculars. So was it Sherlock that was using the binoculars? Or was it the man using the binoculars? It can be interpreted both ways. And I'm going to move this back over. I think that's good. And we're going to continue on. All right, this is the next thing that you need to know. So you need to know morphemes, which is, again, that smallest unit of meaning. But now we have Noam Chomsky. And the research that he did was mind-boggling. It was the whole idea that our brain is wired for language, and that's how we learn language. Like, it's just our brain is thirsty for it. And he had this whole idea of something that is known as the language acquisition device. Um, and the thing to remember, especially for the sake of the next exam, is that it's this whole idea that there's this structure in our brain that is predisposed 
for acquiring language. Um, so it seems like our brains are just thirsty for knowledge. And the research he did to help with this, um, here are some examples. And again, I know one kind of goes off a little bit, so I might move it ever so slightly if I can find my mouse. There we go. So you have over here, this is a WUG, W-U-G, WUG. Now there is another one. There are two of them. There are two blank. And almost everyone would say, you know, oh, there is a WUG. Now there's another one. There are two WUGs. They would add S to the end. And like no one's ever heard of a WUG before. That's not a word. It's not a real thing. And yet everyone knows instantly that if there's more than them, it's a WUGs or they are WUGs. Here's another example of one. This is a gutch. Now there is another one. There are two of them. There are two gutches. Like, instantly, we know, you know, while it was wug and went to wugs, we know that gutch goes to gutches. Um, and I'm not going to say all of the examples. There's many, many more that were used. But it shows that we kind of, again, have this predisposition um, for language where you don't need to be taught every single word out there um, to be able to use it. You just kind of automatically know the general rules of your language um, after, you know, some exposure to it, and then you can speak words, you know, that you've never spoken before. Um, this also explains why, like a lot of children, you know, they'll see a mouse, and then, you know, if they see another one, they'll be like, oh my god, there's mouses! Like, it, the brain is trying to understand that language and trying to figure it out. No one taught the child to say mouses. They just immediately knew, oh, there's multiple ones. It must be mouses. So they were trying. And it seems like the brain is just hungry for that kind of knowledge. All right. And then we just kind of look at some milestones in language acquisition. Um, it should be noted, if you ever have children of your own, this is not something that is set in stone. Oh, that rhymed. Uh, it doesn't mean that, you know, if your child is still just kind of crying by two months and takes a little longer to do what's known as cooing, that doesn't mean that something is wrong with your child. Um, these are just rough guidelines. Um, but as you'll see, the very first kind of acquisition of knowledge really is crying, where a baby learns that if they don't like something... They just make a noise about it, and if they make a noise about it, eventually they'll get what they want. In a sense, that is a form of communication. It's a language. Um, then you'll see that they start to do cooing, where they just make random sounds. Ooh, ah, yeah! Uh, which is essentially the different vowels that are out there. And then you'll see babbling. About 6 to 12 months, these are, again, the phonemes. So again, it's just random sounds. They have no meaning. Um... This is where you also hear sounds that do not exist in, again, I'm using English as an example, but don't exist in the English language. So babies will make like clicking noises and noises that are phonemes in different cultures. And through just what's being, you know, what gets the parents' attention, you know, if it sounds like they're saying da da, um, they get more praise for it. And just through exposure, um, they eventually go to only speaking the 44 phonemes of the English language. Again, I'm using English as an example. Um, and then you'll see 12 months, you get to kind of the one word phrases, 18 to 24, two word phrases, and then 24 to 36 on average is the more complex uh, sentences. So again, just kind of milestones to know. And then we have this idea of linguistic relativity hypothesis, also known as the Horvian hypothesis. And this is essentially the idea that if you don't have a word to something, you can't think about that thing. So it's the whole idea that language is very, very deeply tied to thinking. And some of this had to do with case studies out there where they found people that were never taught to speak. And, or they were you know, not taught to speak very well, and then over time they were taught more language. Um, and after being interviewed, they, you know, couldn't recall anything from the time before they could speak. So it's that whole idea that, you know, before you know the word happy, you can't really think about happiness because there's no word for it. And it is an interesting hypothesis. There's other words out there in other cultures that represent different feelings that until there's a word for it, like, you never really think about it. 
Um, however, there is research out there that contradicts this. Um, so, and you'll see here, there is a tribe in New Guinea, and they only have two different colors. Or they just have two different words for two different colors, and that's it. Uh, no other colors out there. And yet when you show them different colors, you know, they can still differentiate, you know, more than two. They just happen to only have words for two of the colors. Um, so this shows that even if they don't have a word for other colors, they can still see that there's a difference. Uh, but there's still some skepticism to this as well, because yes, you can physically see that. That's not necessarily thought. But it is interesting that until you know a word, like one of the ideas is, is why children don't have as complex thoughts, especially with emotions. They don't understand bittersweet yet because it isn't, you know, a concept that they've learned, you know, part of their language. But food for thought. And then this is the last slide. There isn't much on this and there will be um, another video in Schoology that doesn't have to do with uh, Kanzi. Uh, but you can look uh, it up if you want. But it's the whole controversy of if humans are the only things capable of language. And you'll see there's all sorts of videos out there where there are animals that appear to be communicating. You know, they are pushing buttons for certain things. Um, and you'll see it. It's why I don't show the video with Kanzi. Is Kanzi has... Um, these screens and these papers that have all these different symbols and Kanzi points to a symbol and it means you know like I want a banana and so they'll push on the banana and they'll get a banana and so Kanzi was able to communicate with people and ask for things and say things and people were like oh my god you know they can learn language where it's not just humans um, but some people think that this is just you know learning through uh, reinforcement and punishment it's just operant conditioning where, you know, they point to the symbol and they get a banana, you know, eventually they learn, oh, if I keep pointing to the symbol, I'm going to get a banana. I like a banana, so I'm going to keep pointing to the symbol whenever I want a banana. Um, and so it's, it's fallen into question if these animals are truly learning, you know, a language um, in such a sophisticated way as we do. Um, like, obviously animals communicate with one another, but a lot of times communication is very, very basic. It's trying to mate and trying to keep people that or you know, animals or things away from you that might hurt you. And that's kind of it. It doesn't have syntax. It doesn't have sentences or descriptions. Um, but you will see on Schoology there's a video that I'm going to have attached of a very, very smart African gray parrot. Yes. Um, incredibly smart bird. And what's so unique about the video, um, which you'll see, is that the bird can answer multiple questions about the same thing when the question is slightly changed. So instead of saying, you know, how many green blocks, if they say, okay, how many red blocks, the bird seems to be un able to understand that, you know, the question has changed now, it's still the blocks, but it's the ones that's red. And it's really quite extraordinary. Uh, and I would argue that it's probably the best evidence out there of animals being able to um, speak in the same way and with the same sophistication as humans. But that is it um, for Module 7.2. And as I promised, it is shorter. And so we will be finishing this chapter with talking about intelligence. And I will try not to go on a uh, tangent about intelligence because there's a lot of misconceptions about intelligences. Um, we'll talk about intelligence tomorrow, and then we will be done with Unit 7. Like, oh my god, already almost done. <laughs>